Okay guys, sorry about the slight delay. Okay, we're going to kick off the lightning talks with Frank. I'm not even going to try and pronounce your name. Secubus. Are we, uh, we good to go? Go. Okay. Uh, like Chris said, I'm Frank Bredijk, although he can never say my surname. Uh, I work as security engineer for Schuberg Phyllis. Here are my other coordinates. If you miss them now, they'll be at the end of the slide. I started coding Secubus because I had a wish. I wish it would be possible to scan all my external IP addresses for vulnerabilities every month. But I was afraid, I was afraid it wouldn't be possible because there wouldn't be the time in the world to actually do it. I was afraid I would have to get up too early, which is about the time I went to bed yesterday. Um, and I was afraid it wouldn't be worth it because I would have to read one report and then a week or a month later I would have to read the second report and it would be only a few minor differences in that report. So given all those parameters, I thought it was a problem that called for some automation. And that's why I wrote Secubus. So Secubus tries to solve the problem of, of working with Nessus in an operational environment and, and streamlining that. Uh, I like Nessus. Um, if, you, if you search for Nessus in the App Store, you actually get Jesus, as Paul pointed out. So uh, it's a good tool. It must be. Um, it's free as in beer if you don't use it commercially. If you do use it commercially, it's actually not priced too bad. But it generates a lot of output. And the scanning takes a lot of time and it's not automated. And you spend a lot of time on analysis. So I think overall the work risk ratio is, uh, is off. So what do we do differently with Secubus? We try to scan automatically from the command line, which means you can do it via the cron tab. Uh, and present the results in a GUI, which allows an easy triage via filtering, and it allows you to tick off findings. So it really fits into this, scandal, you, uh, this cycle. You scan your infrastructure, the system compares your current scan with your previous scan, it assigns a status, new means it's found for the first time, change means you thought it was open or you thought it was no issue in the previous scan, but the output changed, I have to look at it again. And gone means that somebody finally did what you told them to do and fixed their security problems, which is good. So then as, an, uh, as a security guy, you go and assess. You assign a status to the uh, findings, which is an either issue or no issue, depending on if it's a security risk, or solved if it's fixed and you're actually happy that it was fixed. And then you go and scan again. So scanning, like I said, happens automatically. Nothing to do, nothing to see, so let's move on. Comparing is done by the system based on the previous on the status I just explained. System assigns you the status, and then you go and assess. Now this is the GUI, as you can see it doesn't look as pretty, version 2 will look prettier. And you can filter your findings, so you can slice and dice your findings any way you want it. You can filter by host, by port, or by plugin. And then you can assign your own status here, and leave a little mental note as to when you go back two years later and you go, why did I put that on no issue? You have a record. Then you manually assign your status, open a no issue, fixed or hard masked. Hard masked being for those findings that Nessus is good at and are only there to show that the contractor didn't earn his money. For instance, here's the trace route to the box. So basically by doing some automatic comparison, you can get a dramatic reduction in the time you spend on analyzing your scan. So if you do it by hand, if you insist on doing it by hand, it means getting up early, looking at non-informative findings, doing a lot of boring repetitive work yourself, and have a lot of work even if your infrastructure hasn't changed a lot. If you let Secubus do it, it means you can schedule your scans. You only have to look at the findings that need your attention. You have less errors because you've got less repetitive work. You've got a better proportion, uh, better mix between the effort you have to put in and the amount of change on your platform. And we all know that if platforms change frequently, there's a higher risk. So we're currently on version one. We're working on version two, and it will have better performance. It will have a real database backend, which makes it easier to link multiple findings to a single issue or a single issue to multiple findings. We'll support more scanners. Nmap, Metasploit Express, uh, maybe um, yeah, Rapid7, Nexpos. We'll have a more open architecture instead of a collection of scripts and more manager type of information, things like graphs, dashboards, and a report writing module, which hasn't made it to this slide yet. 
So where do you get it? Go to secubus.com, and if you didn't get my uh, coordinates, they'll be in the next slide. Any questions? I've got about 30 seconds, so if you can ask it in 15, I can answer it in 15. Thank you. Hey, Mark. Gently. Yep. X Men Wolverine. No. I can. I prefer to do that. Starting the timer. Or? It's already running. Oh shit. Uh, okay, um, folks. As you can see, my name's Mark. Uh, presentation is uh, being a volunteer incident handler. So um, everyone, I presume, knows of Ireland and has heard of Ireland. So in Ireland, we're famous for a couple of things: uh, having really good Guinness and uh, a green countryside. But unfortunately, what we don't have is a cert. So Ireland was, I think, one, the only European country that didn't have uh, an official CERT. So a couple of years ago, a group of us set up our own CERT. And this presentation just talks really about being an incident handler and doing it on a voluntary basis while having a real-time job. So essentially, we're a group of volunteer handlers. We do weekly handler shifts. There's about 10 or 12 of us. Uh, local security professionals, again, all real-time jobs doing it voluntarily and uh, not-for-profit organization. Essentially what we do is we take alerts in from other certs across Europe, from organizations like Arbor Networks, um, emails, and things like that, and then we filter them and send them out to our constituents. So that would be three or four hundred companies across Ireland. And this is all done not-for-profit, free, and we wanted basically an alert system that wasn't like bug track. So if you're on bug track, basically you get, you know, four or five hundred vulnerabilities a week. And we didn't really want that. We wanted something more targeted. And what do we see? Essentially, we see, like everyone else, we see viruses, trojans, spyware, web application vulnerabilities. Um, but what we did see last year was something that uh, Stephen touched on earlier on. Um, this basically is Trinity College, so that's a university in Dublin. Uh, we saw a bunch of legitimate websites in Ireland getting hacked. iframe was injected into them. The domains were all registered in Russia, so the iframe pointed to one domain, which redirected to multiple other domains. Everything was registered in Russia, but the websites were actually hosted in China. And as a result of making get uh, requests and post requests to those websites in China, you had Scareware downloaded onto your desktop. And that resulted in uh, making SSL connections to uh, websites hosted in Canada with valid SSL certs and stuff like that. So if it hadn't been for us, we wouldn't, w no one in Ireland would have known that issue and known that multiple websites were hacked. So we did that in our spare time. So essentially, that's why we're there. We're there to uh, you know, help people. But unfortunately, as anyone who's an incident handler knows, you get a multitude of reactions. The first one is usually, holy shit, what am I going to do? Uh, I've been hacked. It's the end of the world. The second one is, uh, actually just disappeared, but it's basically uh, what the fuck. Um, so what we try and do is we follow like a Zen process. And the Zen process is uh, essentially, I think Chris Nickerson touched on it. It's basically learning how to communicate with the users in a better way. Uh, instead of going, hey, someone got shell on your system, it's, you know, look, you've got this vulnerability, it's being exploited, and uh, it's going to cost you this much. And yeah, mix, mixed up the orders. Uh, in the last two years, I've I guess probably handled, um, I don't know, 40 or 50 incidents. And out of those 40 or 50, two people have said thank you. So, you know, we do a volunteer service, we help people, but don't be expecting people to actually thank you for it. And essentially, this is why I volunteer. Brian Honan's the head of CERT, and he keeps promising that we're going to get a new handler to, uh, you know, lift the workload, but she hasn't arrived yet, unfortunately. So, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, finally, then, from the Newswire, IrisCon, we have our own conference. It's part of the non-for-profit approach that we take. SANS are one of our sponsors. It's 18th of November. It's held in Dublin. There's a recession in Dublin. Prices have gone down. Hotel prices have gone down. Beer's gone down. You know, there's a lot of people like looking for a way out. So if you're a rich single security guy and you've got like a couple of days free, you know, come on over. There's world-class speakers and uh, hotels are pretty cheap and there's lots of beer. And there's also a Capture the Flag contest, which is <coughs> based on uh, the SANS sec 560 and a some of the hex factor stuff as well, so it's quite similar to that. And there's Guinness, in case you didn't hear that. So that's basically it. Okay, and Andreas? My name is Andreas, and um, the title of my talk is Procrastinators Do It Tomorrow because we have all been waiting way too long to do something about computer security. Um, yeah, if you look at the IT security market, the people spend a lot of money on security solutions uh, 30 billion a year. Half is on services, that's you guys. Uh, the other half is hardware and software that does interesting stuff. And half of that, again, is virus scanners and firewalls. Now, we all know how much uh, virus scanners and firewalls help. And I think Joe has shown how the other stuff that the security industry is selling, like IDSs, uh, network access control, etc., etc., is working. There's pictures missing. The fuck? Okay, so... In the end, um, you have the feeling that defense is dead, but um, since you cannot buy anything that actually helps against uh, what, your, uh, what real attackers can do, right? If somebody writes a target exploit right for you, um, you're fucked. So, but my uh, stance is that defense is not dead. It's like uh, this punk, he's just sleeping. And how am I gonna... Macintoshes. I hate those. There are my other slides. You wouldn't need it yeah. your Linux. Okay, so defense is just sleeping. Um, if you look at the computers we use, um, they've been inspired. They actually are Unix or they are Unix inspired because uh, current Windows is modeled after um, the DEC operating systems um, and those were modeled after Unix and Unix actually was a pun on Multics Multix was a operating system for Honeywell supercomputers. You see it here in the picture, and um, <laughs> that's, that's four years ago. And they invented concepts like using high-level languages to write a kernel. They actually invented the concept of kernels because they invented the concept of rings. So what you see there is an actual picture from a brochure where they are advertising rings as security mechanisms, yeah? and they invented virtual memory. And that, folks, is what we are still using today. And that's a fact. So, oh, I hate it. So, um, things have changed. It's 40 years have passed, and um, there has been scientific progress in um, formal verification. Now, uh, back then, we uh, proved 10 lines of code to be correct manually. These days, you have tools uh, that can do higher order logic and thus abstract uh, formal verification. And you have actual projects out there uh, that are formalized. Comcert is my favorite example. It's a um, compiler that uh, gives proof that the input is semantically equivalent to the output. Um, EADS is using that for being able to run proofs across uh, the source code instead of uh, across the binary which they, they used to do. Uh, there's a formally verified L4 microkernel um, 
So it's, it's actually doable to uh, write real-world systems um, and prove their correctness these days. And um, also compiler uh, theory has much has made much progress. So um, if you want to get rid of uh, certain classes of bugs like buffer overflows, you need to have abstraction mechanisms in your language that prevent you from making that mistake. And uh, for, for a lot of other problems, the same. Yeah, if you have garbage collection, you do not get uh, double free uh, problems or uh, access after free problems. And the whole class of security problems we have can be eliminated using uh, intelligent language design. And we have made progress um, with regard, regard to performance of uh, those systems. So y you get all this, and it still can be fast. So it is about time. Did I say something about Macintosh is yet? Uh, it, it's about time that somebody takes all this progress and puts it into a new machine where everything started from fresh, right? Uh, everything's uh, designed from scratch to be secure, to be fast. And there actually is such a program. Um, DARPA has... Um, oh, my time is over? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Okay, so um, th they're doing that. And... And that. <laughs> yeah. I'm really sorry. And it's totally awesome and will rock in five years. Uh, Patrick Hoff, forgotten JBoss. See, he's got his own laptop. It's all good. Yeah, it's an e-book. It's not going <laughs> to work anyway. Go. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Patrick. I work for Red Team Pen Testing. Uh, guess what my day job is? Um, I want to talk to you about forgotten JBoss application server uh, exploitation techniques because um, JBoss is fun. It's a Java application server which uh, is similar to Tomcat but with more bells and whistles. So, how many of you know JBoss or have at least heard of it? Great. So this is my favorite uh, one-click remote code execution exploit for it. It's one get request. And let us see what happens here. So um, can you see it in full? Uh, not really. Well, I think it's OK. Um, what we do here is we use the JMX console, which is kind of a, um, yeah uh, administration console for JBoss. And if that one's open, you can invoke mbeans, which are the components uh, and methods from them. Uh, here we invoke the store method, which allows you to um, store arbitrary files on the file system, which is great because what we can do is we can store our own um, exploit code there. Normally what you want to do is you want to put a zip file in there, or a so-called web archive, which is nothing more than a glorified zip archive with uh, XML data and stuff. But um, that is the second thing that's in here. You can also do some exploded deployment. That's how they call it, which just um, lets you put the whole directory structure after you yeah, unzip this web archive on the server. So. What we can do with this method is we um, just have to give it the right directory name, in this case shell.var for web archive. We give it the name of the file we want to store, which is shell, and then we give it the extension, which is .jsp, and then we put our code in there, which uh, in this case just runs an arbitrary command. So with this simple get request, you get complete ownership of the server depending on what, with what access rights the code is running. The last uh, parameter is just telling you whoops, if, it's, um, if it should be hard to play it or not. Um, if you say um, false there, then it's going to hard deploy every time you're going to run this get request. Um, the second nice thing about this is this is fully um, CSRFable which is known since um, 2007 at least, um, but I think people must have known of this before. Um, so the JMX console 
does not protect against CSERF. So you can just put this in an image, for example, and run it, and it'll work. So put this on your favorite JBoss administrators forum or whatever, and um, you're good to go. So the next time you find a JMX console, which is password protected, this might be one of your attack vectors. OK. Um, how much time do I have left? That was pretty fast, right? Go. Like a minute. One minute, great. So if you want to know more about JBoss, JBoss exploitation techniques, look at our website. It's in the publications JBoss. There's papers, there's scripts for other attack vectors. Uh, and also have a look at the Metasploit modules if you want to. Um, I wrote at least one of them and participated in writing the others. They show you more of these exploitation techniques. OK, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. My name's Matt, I'm from South Africa, I don't know actually where I am right now. Um, backdoors, or back during the backdoors, something I was messing around with. I'm not talking about this, thankfully. I'm probably going to be stating the obvious, so if um, I bore you, I'm sorry, I'll buy you a beer to apologize later. In South Africa, I used to work for a bank for my sins, it wasn't great, in fact it was like pulling hair. I felt like this a lot of the time because you're banging your head against bureaucracy most of the time. The rest of the time I was dealing with that. Those aren't banking websites, those are bank phishing sites. And because I'm from Africa, I live pretty close to the uh, 419 country of doom, which I'm sure you all know about. But because of it, there were phishing sites, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Because there were phishing sites, I also saw a lot of this, uh, PHP shells, that sort of thing, fun and games that the guys used to use. I can promise you that the, the guys that we used to try and track down were not you know, masters of, of you know, intellects. They were skiddies, noobs or the unwashed masses, as we like to call them. This is nothing really new. I'm, I'm telling you all stuff that you already know. Um, but hey, it's five minutes, so deal with it. <laughs> a lot of the code was look, looked like this, um, base64 encoded stuff. I can guarantee that none of those unwashed masses knew what that is, because come on. Was it for evasion, anti-forensics, um, hiding stuff from sysadmins who found these files? I don't know. I'm not a doctor, and I don't play one on TV. Um, what it was about was ET phoning home. All those scripts um, did stuff like this. Don't know if you can see that, but those are mail messages going back to, you know, stuff defined in the PHP scripts, basically telling, um, you know, what the server, what the server URL is, the script name, all that sort of stuff. That's not right. You know, it's not exactly what we, what we want. We don't want stuff like host names, IP addresses, vital statistics of the servers going back to these guys. Is it interesting? To me it was at the time, per partly because I was at a bank and, and dealing with a lot of phishing and, and wanting to claw my eyeballs out because it's fucking boring. So probably not. Um, I don't sleep much, which is why I wrote this, this little presentation for you guys. And I think that's about it. Shortest lightning talk ever. Well done, well done. Keep it short, leave them wanting. Okay, would uh, Wicked Clown please come up? Stick it in. That's what she said. Bear with me for a second, we're just going to reset the timer. Our very technical timer, created by the amazing Didier Stevens. And now it's red. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming. And go, go. All right, uh, my name is Vicar Clown. This is a talk I did called Keep It Simple, Stupid, Otherwise Kiss. Um, what I want you to take away from this talk is that you don't need to be a hardcore ninja hacker to find vulnerabilities, weaknesses, applications, or write complex code. And simple attacks works just as good as a complex attack. Um, what have I discovered? Um, basically, anyone who connects to your terminal server can run um, basically any application they want, completely bypassing your group policy settings, giving a false sense of security. Um, but not I've only tested this on 2000 and 2003. Um, is the security issue or not? Um, I released it um, to the public in April, um, and a majority of people have come back and said, yes, they think it's an issue, but some have said it's just a configuration issue and not security. I spoke to James Lambert at Black Hat, who is the security director of Microsoft. Um, he told me he thinks it's an issue and I should contact Microsoft Security, so I did. And they never commented and got back to me, so screw them. Um, this is open by default on all the Windows servers, as I tested. And yes, I have seen this in the wild. Um, are you vulnerable? If you haven't seen that tab before, then yes, you're pretty much vulnerable and open to this. Um, I've got a video to show this to keep it nice and easy. Um, if I can find it. There it is. Bloody Max. Help. Mac, help. Support. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, he's put it up behind the back. That's it. Just try that first. Can you go to full screen? Alright, this is a group policy, as you see. And, um, this is the similar icon that's saw before, but it won't allow it to do in group policy. Um, as you see, it's pretty much locked down. I've disabled a bunch of stuff. All the control op options are removed. Um, I've only allowed, oh sorry, disabled command.com, CMD, Internet Explorer, Notepad, so they can't remove that. They can only run um, Calki XC and MS Paint. Um, so, and they've also disabled 16 bit applications, so the administrator thinks he's knows his shit. Uh, so basically, we're connecting to the terminal server as the restricted user. Just log in. We can run Calc as expected, Notepad. Yeah, oh, sorry, paint. No pads blocked. Um, all the security options have been disabled, so pretty much locked down as it can be. Um, but if we log out, we log back in again. But this time, if we go to um, programs and options and put in an application we actually want to run instead, we actually then start to bypass the system. So we log back in. Um, well, yes, I haven't done it yet. Um, so basically, we log back in, um, command.cmd what's blocked, so we try command.com, good old favourite, because he's disabled the 16 bit application, it's blocked again, so the guy, like I said, looks like he should be doing it. But if we uh, log back in again, if we go to, um, say, Internet Explorer, we now have that access as it logs in. Talking faster than the video. So we log in, now we've got Internet Explorer. So as it says, cmd.exe was blocked. So what we can, we can be a bit bastard, go to iCat, which is an awesome site, check it out. It's good for hacking internet kiosks. But the best thing about it is it's got a modified CMD for us to download. So we can download that. And we download it. And we save it to the Windows 10 folder, which even on a restricted machine, everybody has rewrite access to. So you just have to put it into there. So C slash Windows slash temp cmd.exe and then if we try to open it from here we actually are blocked but again we just log back out and change it to c slash um, temp slash windows also windows temp slash cmd.exe and we log in and bingo we've got command prompt uh, this could have been any application, this could be in a Windows, Metatub, Shell, or whatever we wanted to connect back. Um, from the, also from this, um, tap, this box, we can run any other applications within Windows. As you see, I've got access to browsing the hard disk, uh, I can run Notepad, if you remember it was in the um, denied application. So, if I can go back to my conclusion quickly. I don't like Macs. Ah, uh, screw it. Anyway, my conclusion is, if you want to check it out, just go to my website. It's um, www.tombstone-bbs.co.uk or email me at wicked.clown. And... All right.
Oh, there you go. There's all the details. So do I think this is a security issue? Yes. Um, so there you go. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Wicked Clown. Okay, would uh, Martin Knobloch or Martin Garlic please step forward? Oh, Wasp. The open web app. He had to leave and he didn't think maybe mention it would be a great. No, okay. That's a challenge. <sighs> all right. Uh, oh, Wasp. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Route to a tall defense by Francoise Rupert. Woo! Person. You want to talk about OWASP as well? Check it. Get in. What is it? Short delay here, guys. It's quite as quick as my girlfriend tells me. Apparently, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might got some decent media player on here. I usually save this one for my porn, but I'll let you use it. It's right. <laughs> no, you cannot make a connection. Die. This is why you should all bring your own laptops. Decent freaking laptops. <laughs> so, uh, and this is how you fuck up a lightning talk. Okay, yeah, we're good to go. We're good to go. Um, okay. So, um, I will talk to you about um, a tool I created um, because um, uh, I see some uh, sol some likes of uh, uh, good router um, which were secu secured on the on the field. Where I think there there was a big lack of uh, education of uh, users and the network administrators um, about the Cisco IOS security. Mm. In fact, I um, I didn't see any uh, any uh, a lot of uh, of uh, Cisco routers nor switch uh, which have the default uh, best command practice uh, that you can find um, by example on Cisco.com or um, any other network design uh, best practice uh, that are commonly uh, adopted by the industry. Um, so the tool is. Um, is to um, to uh, do an assessment of uh, the configuration from uh, the iOS devices. Um, so it's totally agnostic, um, considering the um, the use of these uh, routers and uh, switch. It could be run over IPv4, v v6, and even MPLS, like uh, securing the, the LDP authentication. Or, uh, or with IPvC, uh, do some checks um, with uh, the um, uh, like the, the RFC uh, 4890, which uh, told uh, some some use about uh, the ICMP uh, protocols. Um, so uh, I base those t uh, also my tools with uh, other documents uh, which were public. Mm on uh, the NSA and uh, my experience um, that by example uh, every uh, people uh, there knows about dot one x but uh, um, I found that uh, in the field um, a less amount of people know about dot three x um, which could be um, a serious threat um, if used um, by uh, attackers um, it can also help uh, epic fail from uh, vendors 
just by being proactive on the security uh, configuration. Okay, so, so um, oh, I've got to set up a little script to run it. Um, like you can see, there is a template which we, you can define many information about the iOS version. The, uh, it takes uh, also in account the, the, um, the type of network you are running and the infrastructure, uh, like uh, if uh, there is a IPv4, IPv6. Um, here you can see uh, uh, XML output uh, of uh, all the tests you, uh, which exist, um, so it can it can run a, a report, a general report, but, but uh, also uh, with a unique some unique uh, testing like uh, URPF, if you just want to to check if uh, your your router is uh, configured for like uh, anti-spoofing. Uh, um, uh, defense. Um, so that's a report uh, in uh, links. Um, uh, you have a uh, lot of tests uh, which are done. Um, I take this one as a, it's a configuration you can find uh, anywhere in the field. It uh, has many tests. Here you can see an uh, IPv6 uh, uh, access list. Um, so uh, there, there is uh, some additional work to do to enhance the IPv6 support, uh, some outputs, um, and uh, other other things. Round of applause for the PIMP. Hey, hey, man. Show us the teeth. See now, I'm screwing up my presentation now. I haven't got the teeth. I haven't got the teeth. Whoa! See now, people are screwing up my presentation now. So yeah, my name is Christian Riley, and I lost a bet with with that man. <laughs> that I would uh, do this presentation dressed as a pimp. So, um, I'm here to pimp my tool, homies. Um, this is how to pimp your tool, okay? Um, I'm a blogger. I do podcasting really, really badly. Um, and I do penetration testing for a bank. Um, I'm also on Twitter and I talk far too much, so you shouldn't follow me. And I hate Max. <laughs> uh, okay, there you go. Okay, so this is UA Tester. This is the tool I, I wrote for two reasons. One, um, I wanted to learn Python. And um, I was notoriously bad at scripting, and I thought, well, I need a project for Shizzle. You know. um, and I thought, well, I'll program something I can actually use. I don't want to just learn it. I don't want to do Hello World. So I programmed it for that reason. The other reason was because I have this tremendous fear of presenting. So I'm getting over that now by presenting in a pimp suit. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> See it? Anyone want to buy a MacBook Pro? Okay, so um, for those people who doesn't know, UA means user agent. Okay, when you when you send a request to a server, um, you're sending a user agent string, and that user agent string says what kind of system you've got. It says you're using Linux. It says you're using an iPad. It says that you're using uh, wget or any number of other tools and most people don't think that this is a problem okay most people don't think that this is something that the web server is going to do anything about what you find is that when you're accessing sites if you send different user agent strings 
I mean, how does how does it Twitter know that you want it like skinny and long, and wide and fat? I got girls who like it both, just in case you need them. Yeah. Um, but but it uses the user agent string, and and when you're doing penetration testing, you need to know this because if you're not testing both of these sites, if they're on different servers or they're using different code bases, um, you're missing out. You're not you're not covering the entire application. Okay, so. What do you get back when you send a standard browser um, user agent string? Okay, you're getting back the standard stuff, status 200, it's telling you it's got XSS protection turned on, X frame, X frame option, same origin. Okay, but if you send the same thing with a Nokia Symbian user agent string, you can see there's, there's less. Okay, if you do a comparison, I mean, how easy is that to compare? How long is that going to take you to, to kind of dig through and go, well, that's slightly different there? Imagine testing that with 50 user agent strings, 100 user agent strings, however many you need to test. That's a pain. I'll make it a little bit easier for you. A little bit of pimp magic. Okay, these are the things that are different, okay? But that's going to take you a while to go through, and you don't want that, okay? You want a tool that's going to do it all for you. So this is a tool based on Python. It's going to run through a list of common user agent strings. It's going to run through Firefox, IE, Opera, iPad, iPhone, and all that kind of stuff. And it's going to tell you the differences, okay? Because depending on what you're accessing, if you're sending HTT Track or iNASL, put that one in there for you, man. Nessus, Nessus. <laughs> Do you like to say random storm? No. <laughs> and, and then if you send some weird stuff like PS3 or the Apache Traceback or even the uh, iPhone Whisper user agent string, it's just going to do different stuff, okay? So you need to output the differences in those response so that penetration testers can cover everything. So, you need to pimp your penetration testers, okay? Like Velvet Jones says, pimp. Okay, so, your average penetration tester, these are some figures I made up earlier, is covering maybe 50% of your application. Penetration tester with my app, is covering like, what, 85%? <laughs> I mean, that's like, m much, much more. And then you got like Ligat, who's like minus 25. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, yeah. Okay, so UATS is taking the challenge out of that. It's, it's doing everything you need it to do without you having to, to worry about testing everything manually. You can do this stuff in Burp Suite if you've got the time or the patience. But this is going to do it all for you, okay? It's free. Use it as you want. It's not particularly good because I wrote it. Um, but B is optional. Yeah. Look, lots and lots of screenshots and animations and stuff. <laughs> Look, sweet animations. Okay, that's pretty much it. I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Those are my own teeth, man. They're not pimp teeth. So, where did we leave off yesterday? Yeah, we're talking about the future, wasn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The future's bright. Uh, yesterday we didn't say, but today we thought would it could be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Future is hackerspace's signal. Who have heard from hackerspace's signal? Well, it's quite a few. We did it well in a month. <laughs> Got some souls to convince yet. Well, uh, for who's here and does know signal, signal is the new hackerspace's radio station, and we came up with the idea actually a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were attacking at random, and uh, something uh, something came up. We do a radio station, and we just built something. And afterwards, we thought, well, why shouldn't we do it more often? And uh, then we came up with the idea, why shouldn't we do the hackerspace hour again, and so on, and so on. So then it became quiet. We had to do some preparations, and uh, we were busy as hell. But um, we were building, 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 and now. Signal is born. What do we have uh, over there? Yeah, we got the we got the streaming server. 
You, you know the techniques, by the way. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just using IceCast. Uh, I guess everyone knows it. It's a streaming application, and um, we have a studio uh, at the moment uh, in RevSpace where we do uh, a lot of stuff. This is actually an old picture. We have a nice uh, on-air uh, sign that you need, of course. Um, we've got a nice mixing desk. This is all paid for by H66 because we are going to use this for events as well. Like, uh, well, hacking at random. We had a studio. We now have a, a permanent equipment for that. Um, and also at the, the CCC camp. Yeah. And within this uh, infrastructure, we are we also making podcasts of the live uh, of the live broadcasting, and um, you can download them. We are even in evil iTunes. So just uh, just go to iTunes. Put hackerspace's signal in, and then. Uh, but then, then it but came. Yeah, then yeah, we had really had a problem. We fucked up. Yeah, we really you know, up. We, we broadcast every Thursday from uh, 10 till midnight, and yep. then after that, I have to put the, the, the stuff in the archive and, and enter a nice description. And what I did, I, I messed up uh, Chris Chris's name. I, I misspelled your name. So, and I'm deeply sorry about that. So to make up, I, I brought something for you. There's the cheese. <laughs> sorry, sorry for messing up your name. I hope you won't lose this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> else, else you will have to. Uh <laughs> Be glad we didn't put it in the microwave first. <laughs> hey, about the future. Um, there's going to happen a lot more. Currently, we have uh, we have uh, multiple people who are working on uh, Signal. Astara is on there. Uh, Mumpy and Juntgen from. Uh, uh, from the Finalit are, uh, are going to do a live show. That's going to be cool. Yeah, Social Hack, uh, he had, uh, he's doing talks about anthropology. I thought the, at first I thought it was ornitholo ornithology, but uh, <laughs> that's something different. Uh, we're still doing the Hackerspace Hour. You're going to the States and going to do the live Hackerspace Hour? Yeah, I'm going to basically visit all the Hackerspaces in the States. There are a lot, so i am be gone for six weeks, but um, I'll be reporting on that as well. Yeah. And uh, if you want to be in uh, one of our shows uh, in the future, just give us an email or uh, pop in at, uh, on our, our IRC channel. Hackerspace is signal at Freenode. Freenode. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And we will probably also go to uh, the uh, CCC camp next year. Definitely. Yeah. We will broadcast probably live from there. So just yeah, pop in. under the name of Binary Voice, actually, which is the event radio station name. But yeah. And just if you have any questions, send us an email. And um, we'll probably hear you next Thursday, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, that, that's it. That's the end of the lightning talks. Um, I'd like to, to especially thank um, Didier for the amazing clock that flashes and wiggles around. And it's really pimp. I like that. Um, we do have a special prize, which Dale is going to give, because he's been sitting on his ass doing absolutely nothing throughout the entire Lightning Talks. Dave Pearson, everyone. Dale. My name is Pearson. <laughs> okay. I'll tell my answer there. I need to do more. So, someone else who's not here is Craig Balding. He was here yesterday. And even though he's not here, if we can give him a round of applause for getting the Lightning Talks in here and organising it and sorting all that stuff out with you guys. Excellent. So, I think most of you appreciate to do a lightning talk is probably quite difficult if you haven't done it before and get up here and speak in front of all you people and get the time management right and all that sort of thing. So, the kind guys, I can't even do time management, but, uh, the Brucon guys have kindly offered to give us a prize for who we think gave the best lightning talk over the last two days. So, we think it is me. <laughs> Definitely not you. Pimps don't count. Is Wiki Clown. So if we can give a round of applause. Congratulations. <laughs> Speech. Make make it short. Make it short. Thank you. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. Look, look. It even says one free Brucon 2011 ticket. Awesome. It's on a piece of cardboard, but Thank it is you. official. <laughs> <laughs> Round of applause, please. And there's more. And a gift. No, it's not for you, it's for me. 
<laughs> but I think Benny's going to cover the uh, the closing ceremony now. So, uh, I, well, I'm not closing the freaking thing. I'm dressed as a pimp. <laughs> <laughs>